thank you very much for uh, inviting me to uh, talk at this year's uh, uh, Energy Center meeting. I'm a little apprehensive about doing this because I can hardly think that the thing I'm going to say today you don't already know here especially pretty well, but I'm going to do it anyway. Um, so we're going to talk about, I did, I did have a, a, a career in the chemical industry, uh, and so I'm, I'm going to try to say how shell gas and oil have impacted or will impact the, the chemical industry, but before I do that, and for actually most of the talk, I want to do, talk about some historical things that will set that in context, I hope. So as I'm sure all of you associated with the chemical industry know, natural gas is the fuel that powers most, but not all, of the U.S. chemical industry and refining processes. And natural gas is the raw material. At least natural gas methane is the feedstock for things like hydrogen and so on, and for syngas and things you make out of that, like methanol and methyl tertiary butyl ether. And natural gas condensate, that's the ethane and the propane part, after it's been cracked to ethylene and propylene, uh, is the raw material for the vast majority of the organic chemical industry. So indeed, our industry has uh, uh, gas as an important, uh, an important raw material. Uh, but it, always, it wasn't always that way. So I want to talk a little bit about the history of natural gas and its use and some other things, and particularly how policies, governmental policies and other things have altered prices and that's altered the chemical industry because I think that's going to impact when we finally talk about shale. So early natural gas in this country was mostly associated with the coal fields of central Appalachia and was mostly considered a dangerous um, nuisance in coal mines. Its first industrial use was as a furnace fuel in the production of glass, because it was a clean fuel. And also locally in central Appalachia, it began to use for heating. The next natural gas usage in this country was associated with, not far from here, the East Texas oil field, where the associated gas was, was uh, an issue. And it began to be used, not just flared. And it began to use for both domestic and commercial heating. But as the markets for that were farther and farther away from this field, then we had to develop a, a system of pipelines. And continued after that, both associated and non-associated gas, associated and non-associated with oil, uh, in various places turned out to be major sources of methane and ethane and propane in the U.S., including gas from places like Kansas and West Texas and onshore and offshore Gulf. So this is a map of the national gas uh, pipeline system in this country. And the places that are dense are basically the places that are sources, so that's a lot of gathering pipelines. But if you look, and so here's central Appalachia where it first started. Here's East Texas and parts of Louisiana where it came second. Here's other major gas producing parts of this country. And if you look at the pipeline system that now exists, gas is available in virtually every urban area in the country. Okay, so from just a couple of sources, and there's some other sources in places, but gas is available almost everywhere. All right. Now, as a chemical feedstock in the chemical industry, gas wasn't always our feedstock. The early feedstocks in the chemical industry up through the first third of the last century were, well, wood pyrolysis for make, distilling trees, for making methanol and acetic acid. Fermentation was the source for ethanol, butanol, and acetone. Uh, coal tar, byproduct of producing coke, coke was produced for steel, but the byproduct of producing coke is coal tar. Coal tar contains lots of aromatics like benzene and cresols and aniline and so forth. Settling, which in turn, coke was reacted with lime to make calcium carbide, which was reacted with water to make acetylene. And so acetylene was the organic raw material for much of the chemical industry. And then synthesis gas, which was also made from coke and steam at the time. Synthesis gas is carbon monoxide and hydrogen mixture. And that was used for ammonia and then later methanol after to replace trees. 
So the, male, the major milestones in the chemical industry 100 or so years ago and a little bit more were things like the entire synthetic dye industry, which basically came from coal tar, high temperature. Once we had high temperature because of new materials of construction that enabled the handling of corrosive things at high temperature, like acetic acid, that was important and that enabled a bunch of chemistry. Repi chemistry is just the kind of chemistry that involves, well, original repi chemistry was all kinds of, of um, acetylene derivatives. Germans learned to take acetylene and make just about everything out of it by all kinds of different reactions. And because of that, acetylene was the major organic raw material for the industry. And then when high pressure was invented, that was an engineering accomplishment to learn how to make high pressure but also contain it. And that led to processes like ammonia and uh, methanol later that um, once we had that, then the chemical industry began to increase even more. All right. Later, especially after the Second World War, there were changes. And the changes happened because of a couple of things. Yes, there was natural gas infrastructure, the distribution infrastructure is almost everywhere. Steam reforming of natural gas, reaction of methane with water to make carbon monoxide and hydrogen made those things available. Steam cracking of natural gas condensate, that's the reaction of ethane and propane at high temperature to make ethylene and propylene in the presence of steam, not as a reactant, but it suppresses coke formation. Uh, and so that led to the availability of olefins. And then another thing that happened during the Second World War is that catalytic reforming of straight chain hydrocarbons to make aromatics. That was originally invented to make higher octane aviation fuel, but it also became the source of aromatics uh, for the chemical industry. And so methane, ethylene, propylene, butadiene, benzene, toluene, xylenes became the principal feedstocks of the organic chemical industry, replacing the things that they had before, wood, coal tar, coke, and acetylene. All right? This all happened in the early 50s and through the 60s. All right? So that completely changed the earlier feedstocks. You know, virtually the entire industry has different feedstocks, and those different feedstocks were derived from mostly natural gas, but also catalytic reforming of longer chain things in oil refineries. OK. So since that time, we've had what I will call supply chains that were based on molecular length. So we had the C1 chain which mostly came from carbon monoxide. And the C1 chain was used, among other things, to make hydrogen. Oops, I'm sorry. Used to make hydrogen, ammonia, methanol, formaldehyde, all those things came from C1. Uh, C2 chain, ethane, which either came from natural gas condensate or it came from light naphtha fractions in oil. And that was used for such things as ethylene, ethylene glycol and ethylene oxide, acetaldehyde, acetic acid, vinyl acetate, vinyl chloride, styrenes, propionaldehydes, propionic acid. All those chemicals, whether or not they had two or more carbons in them, all came from C2s. The C3s, which all came from propane, which again came from condensate or light naphtha, and it went into things like propylene and cumene and phenol and acetone and the acrylates and methacrylates, butyraldehydes and butyric acids. And then the aromatics, which actually came from oil. The aromatics, which came from oil catalytic reformate for benzene, styrene, phenol, toluene, xylene, terephthalic acid. You're looking here at the vast majority by weight of the organic chemicals in our industry. OK? And that's where they came from. And that's kind of what happened post-World War II. And it continues to the present day. All righty. So, in this industry of ours, we have supply chains which turned out to be fairly stable. We had lots of raw material, and these, these processes and plants and products were built from those products, and life was pretty good. It led to the development of many large volume products, especially polymers. So, synthetic polymers like polyethylene and polystyrene and polyester and nylons and all those things, those were all developed. Uh, in the, and commercialized and became big because of stable supply chains. Rapid growth of the American chemical industry, 
we had what we believe is, was advantageous raw materials. Turns out that condensate from natural gas tends to be less expensive than light naphtha from oil. The United States got much of its ethylene and propane, and therefore ethylene and propylene, from natural gas condensate. Europe got almost all of it from naphtha. That made the United States advantaged, economically advantaged, as the principal raw material for a huge part of the organic chemical industry. And that led to a significant positive contribution to the balance of trade in this country. So chemicals at one time were the third most exported thing from the United States. And so it, it was a big part of the, of the economy. All righty. Now, the supply chains are there. And you got the raw materials of different kinds. And you got all those chemicals you can make from them. But sometimes change happens. And sometimes catalysis can turn things on their head. And I just want to just give you one example where that happened. So for example, there's, there was repi chemistry that reacted carbon monoxide with um, alcohols to make acids. Repi chemistry that was almost totally cobalt catalyzed. This chemistry was cobalt catalyst, catalyzed. And the conditions were fairly harsh, thousands of PSI many hundreds of degrees Celsius temperatures. These technologies existed, but weren't much practiced excepting in times of stress like war. So, but it existed, and not so many people did these kind of things. In fact, acetic acid and stuff that could be made from methanol this way were in fact made other ways. Until, Monsanto found out that rhodium would do much of what cobalt would do, catalytically. That shouldn't be a surprise to chemists because it's right below cobalt in the periodic table. It may have taken a while to discover that because rhodium is very rare, typically has a cost about 10 times the cost of gold compared to cobalt, which is almost free, relatively speaking. So maybe that's why it wasn't discovered as early as it could. But nonetheless, Monsanto found out that rhodium would do what cobalt would have done, and it did it almost mild. Barely a 1,000 pounds of pressure and, and temperatures that might have been even less than 100 centigrade. So what happened was that where repi chemistry that was cobalt catalyzed was really not very commercially practical, the, co the rhodium version turned out to be so much so that in fact a different scheme to something like acetic acid, which is one of these repi chemistries, was done where, this is the way we do it anyway, hydrogen and carbon monoxide makes methanol, but the new key is that methanol and more carbon monoxide under rhodium catalysis makes acetic acid and that that chemistry turned out to be more economical than the traditional route of making acetic acid, which was ethylene to acetaldehyde to acetic acid. What I'm trying to say is that acetic acid, after this time, became a C1 chemical instead of a C2 chemical. In other words, it was derived from methane instead of being derived from ethane. And that, so every once in a while, catalysis dramatically changes the, the, the basic supply chain. Okay, and this was the first example that was like that, and there were many others. Okay, now I'm gonna take even a bigger detour. And I wanna spend some time talking about how natural gas gets priced in this country. Well, you probably already know all this, but I'm gonna go through it anyway, because sometimes funny things happen. In 19, first of all, as the natural gas pipeline network began to be developed, pretty soon people were using gas, not just for industrial purposes, but for home heating. By the mid-1950s, natural gas had reached many cities, and people who prior to that might have heated their homes with coal converted to heating their homes with natural gas. And the government began to be concerned that as the, the individual consumers we're beginning to use this new resource, methane, and if that methane was coming, not like coal, which came from many, 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 many producers, methane was coming kind of in a controlled way through a pipeline. The government was concerned that the pipelines or the gas producers might develop monopolistic control. And to keep that from happening, 
1954, the Supreme Court ruled that, in fact, the then Federal Power Commission, it's now Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, but that they had the, they had the authority to regulate the price of interstate gas, gas across the state line. So once that happened, they did. They set a price to protect the consumers, the individual consumers, from monopolistic uh, pricing. They set the price at something like, set a cap price. And that cap price was about 40 cents a million BTUs, 40 cents a thousand cubic feet. And the price to produce gas in those days was like 20 cents. So not a big problem. The cap was higher than the current price of gas. It was controlled. The government felt that it protected people from monopolistic uh, behavior. And what happened is gas consumption and gas production expanded. And it expanded fairly constantly until that pipeline system covered the whole country. And that was good. And indeed, this is uh, gas production in millions of cubic feet. Well, trillions if you look at the number right here. And it, this is from 1949 through about 1972. And gas production, gas consumption went up in a very nice, orderly, regular way. Okay? And all this was fine until it wasn't. And what happened was, well, let's see what it says. It got to a point where the price to produce gas got to be higher than the ceiling. And when that got higher than the ceiling, people stopped drilling so many new wells. And when that happened, you don't see it right away because there's still lots of gas and there's still lots of production and everything is fine until there was a cold winter. And that happened to be the winter of 1976-77, when it was an unexpectedly cold winter and the supply of natural gas in this country did not meet the demand. And so the government stepped in and they shut down industrial consumers to save, of course, gas for the folks who vote. All right. So uh, from an industry point of view, this was kind of grim. Because gas was not only the fuel for the industry, gas was the raw material for much of the industry. Okay? And all of a sudden it was cut off. And it was cut off for over six weeks. So the impact was, was significant in what happened. So I'll just tell you what Eastman did, for example. Eastman's plants in those days were coal fired. So gas didn't affect much of our normal energy production, but we did have some cracking furnaces and stuff that actually used gas as a fuel, and those couldn't run. So where we could, we substituted oil, but there were places where we couldn't. Um, we began to think about making our own synthetic gas, just so we would have gas to burn in cracking furnaces by gasifying coal. We actually did that before natural gas came to East Tennessee, which it got there in the mid-50s. Prior to the mid-50s, we had cracking furnaces, and we gasified coal just to get a gas to, to burn in those furnaces. And we thought about doing that again. In the end, what happened is we used coal gasification, not for fuel, but to do the chemistry. And the chemistry was a kind of a derivative of that uh, Monsanto kind of chemistry. We, what we wanted to make was acetic anhydride. And we learned how to do that from coal. So acetic anhydride had been a one time a C two chemical, then it became a C1 chemical. And I guess coal is still a C1, but it, it was coal, not natural gas based. And so that's what we did. We built that thing. This is a picture, the top picture is of the gasifiers. The bottom picture is the chemical plant that consumed the carbon monoxide and hydrogen that the, the um, gasifiers made to make a whole series of chemicals that included methanol and acetic acid and acetic anhydride, all of which were important for Eastman, as it turns out. All right. Well, what did the government do? When this happened, the government said, oh, uh, you should also know, by the way, at the same time was the second of the two oil shocks. So we had two oil shocks which had to do with folks that exported oil to us withholding oil in order to drive the price up some. And that happened twice. So prior to that, around 1972, oil in this country was about $2.50 a barrel. And the, after these two shocks, it rose to something a little over $10 a barrel. All right. So oil got more expensive, and natural gas, which had gotten short, was, was not available. So the government did a couple things. Number one, 
they passed a law that gr granted the government authority over both interstate as well as intrastate gas. So they said, okay, you can set the price for gas even if it doesn't cross the state line. And the second thing they did is that they began to get rid of the ceilings on gas. They said, look, we want to encourage people to drill more gas wells. So they said, tell you what we're going to do. If you drill a new gas well, it won't have the same kind of ceiling that old gas wells. Now, they didn't want to take the ceiling, those controls off of old gas, because they assumed those wells were producing. People were making profit before. So they didn't want to decontrol the price of any well that was already making gas. But if you're going to well drill a new well, OK, you can have a higher price. So what did people do? You know exactly what they did. They drilled a well right next to the, they capped the well, drilled the well right next to it. Right? The government says, oh, we didn't mean that. So they said, all right, now we're going we're to do it again. The new well has to be so many feet from an old well if you want a new price. To make a long story short, and I'm not going to go into all the details, at one time there were 19 different prices for the same natural gas, depending on when it was drilled and how far from an existing well it was drilled. Okay? Now, who made money with this arrangement? The only people who made money out of this arrangement were the lawyers. Because every time there was a new contract, the buyer argued that it should have been cheaper, and the seller argued that it should have qualified for a more expensive price, and so every contract was litigated again. All right. But what did happen is prices rose, and the average price rose. The other thing that the government did in the same year is they said, you can't use natural gas or oil to make power. And you can't use it to run an industry. So they banned the use of both natural gas and oil for new power plants and new industrial. So power plants to make electricity and new industrial power plants. The reason was gas was short. So don't have the industry people burn a new, new gas. And oil was expensive, so don't have people using new oil either. The idea was, go burn coal or something. All right, that's what they did. So what do you suppose happened to the price of gas? Well, this is the consumption of gas. The consumption actually just went down because they banned its use. Right? So production went, I mean, the, the consumption went down, even though we had enough productive capacity. So over the next 10 or so years, almost 15 years, the production had decreased by about, uh, that's like 25% or so. And the government goes, oh, we didn't mean that to happen. So by 1987, the decade after these things, they changed their mind. And they said, okay, tell you what we're going to do. We repealed the restrictions on using gas for power plants and industrial use. And the next year they said, and by the way, we're not going to control gas, period, price. Just totally decontrol it. You guys let the market figure it out. And the other thing they did about the same time is separate from this, a, a different law, totally unrelated to gas, was to pass the Clean Air Act amendments, which had to do with addressing sulfur dioxide problems from power plant generation. So we were burning coal. Some of the coal had sulfur in it. We are making sulfur dioxide. Sulfur dioxide blows down wind. In some places, that caused acid rain. Acid rain caused destruction of plants. And so they, we passed laws to limit the amount of sulfur dioxide you could produce per unit of power production. And the idea, they hoped, was people would go put sulfur scrubbers in. But what happened instead is people found natural gas. And natural gas has hydrogen sulfide in it, but it's easier to get out than the sulfur out of coal. And so people started switching to natural gas. So what did that do? That increased the demand for natural gas. And so what happened? The consumption went back up again, which is what they had in mind. OK? Everybody's happy. And then in 1992, government did two more things. And they were kind of interesting. The first one is the government decoupled the price of gas from the price of transmission of the gas. It used to be you bought natural gas from the person that had the pipeline to your house. 
okay? And, and probably only one person, one company ran a pipeline to your house, so you didn't have any control. You bought gas from the guy that delivered it. In 1992, the government changed that. They said you can buy gas from anybody who will agree to put it into the distribution system. And you will pay separate for, to that person to put it in the system and some supposed charge to get it delivered from wherever it was put in the system to you. Now, those molecules didn't actually come to you. That wasn't the point. But the point was there was a separate charge and separate people. So you, you paid the pipeline folks to deliver it, and you paid the supplier whatever you could negotiate. Cool idea? Yep. Let me stop right here. That's, so this is great for competition, because now you can buy from anybody. Anybody willing to sell you gas, and, and you just have to pay this supposed transportation charge to get it to you. That gets, so it's good for the consumer because he can, there's a lot more suppliers that he can bid from. It's that may be good for the supplier because the supplier's got a whole lot more customers than just the ones that was on his pipeline. All right? But it gets complicated after a while, and it's, it's, it's a burden to hunt up all the thousands of suppliers that there might be, and so on and so forth. So somebody raised their hand and said, I can fix that, and that was Enron. And what Enron said was, I tell you what, I got a magic computer that knows how to calculate the supposed prices of this transportation. So what I will do is I will make a market. I keep track of all the people who were willing to sell gas, and I'll keep track of all the folks who are willing to buy gas at different prices, and I will match them up so you don't have to do that. I mean, the same way the stock market works. And we will correctly calculate the, the transportation charge, and I will take a little off the top for doing the service. Okay, now, that was cool, and then they did some other things that weren't so cool, and I'm not gonna get into that, but I will over a beer later, if you wish. The other thing that happened in 1992 is the government decided, you understand that making electricity in this country is a highly regulated business. You want to make electricity, that's fine, but because it's like a monopoly as far as government entities are concerned, you have to go to the regulatory board and you have to argue why you should be able to deliver electricity at a certain price. And what are you trying to do? You, of course, want to cover the cost of your operating costs, the fuel that you need to buy for your electricity, but you also want to recover the capital cost for making the asset to begin with, and you want much, and the regulated people want you to have less, and you argue about this all the time, and then the price of your raw material goes up for whatever reason. Now you've got to go back to the regulator again and try to plead for a higher price. Okay, so that's a business. The government in 1992 said that if you're not a utility, but you make electricity anyway, well, who would do that? It's like a chemical plant that needs heat. The chemical plant needs heat, so it goes out there and it burns natural gas or coal or whatever and makes heat. But you could have made electricity as well as heat. And the government basically said, if you will do that, co-generate the electricity, you can sell that electricity to whomever will buy it without regulation. Okay? So regular utility people were regulated, but independent folks who decided that they would get in the code generation business, they weren't regulated. All right? So what happened? Because that sounds a good idea, right? So what happened? This is a plot of new electrical generating capacity in this country from 1995 to 2009. The red lines are the amount that was natural gas powered. Uh, the green lines here are wind, the little yellow lines are PV, uh, one of these is nuclear, a little bit of nuclear came on stream right there, some of this is coal. The point is virtually all of the new electrical generating capacity in this country was natural gas powered, and most of it was deregulated. Okay? Great. Gigantic new consumption demand for natural gas. And this is the natural gas used for power. And it went from, in 1997, from, from 4 trillion cubic feet to almost 7 trillion cubic feet uh, less than 10 years later. So not quite doubled. The entire, the entire uh, natural gas used for electricity nearly doubled in that time period. All right, great. If you're a natural gas producer, that would be great. Except this is a plot of the actual natural gas 
production and consumption. Remember, we don't inventory any. <coughs> and in this time, it was flat. There was this huge new demand for natural gas, but there wasn't new net productive capacity that we were drilling wells as fast as what we were depleting wells. So what happens if you have new demand but not new capacity? This is the price of natural gas. This is when it was, before it was, direct, before we started messing with it, when it was like 25 cents a million BTUs. And this is where it rose during the various periods of, as we were going through this partially deregulating the price. Then after they quit messing with it, from the mid 80s, it was nearly two and a half decades of nearly stable price. And then when this thing happened, the price of gas just took off. Because there was all this new demand, but no new capacity. All right? So what did that do, and what did that do particularly to the chemical industry? Because the power guys, they could get the gas because they could bid for anything they wanted, because they were deregulated so they could sell their electricity for more without going through the regulator. So they could always outbid the chemical industry for an increment of gas, because they weren't controlled on how, what they were going to be able to sell it for. So what was the impact of this? Chemicals that made from methane basically natural gas stuff. Methanol production moved offshore. So methanol is one of the biggest things we made from, 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 uh, me from methane. And every, every me US methanol plant shut down. And they went to places where we call it stranded gas. So some place that doesn't have the infrastructure, it's got gas but no infrastructure to move it. So the biggest methanol producer around here is Trinidad. So the gas is on an island, but you can't get it off the island, but you can turn it into liquid methanol and get the liquid methanol off the island. Or Chile, or parts of the Persian Gulf. All right. MTBE, methyl tertiary butyl ether, which is one of the principal chemicals made from methanol, and was the principal oxygenate. Oxygenates were put in gasoline in order to reduce air pollution. MTBE was the original oxygenate, and basically what we did is we abandoned it. We abandoned it because it got expensive. But that's not what we told the people. We told the people that it smelled bad. And it did, I mean, but the real thing was there was a gas station in Santa Monica, California, whose underground gas tank leaked, and MTBE, being more water soluble than gasoline, got into the local drinking wells, and they said, oh my goodness, we can't have that. And instead of fixing the leaking underground gas tank, we banned MTBE. All right, that's fine. But that's not the reason they did it. The real reason they did it is the government had decided, for political reasons, that ethanol would be a more useful oxygenate because we can subsidize farmers for it. So we just replaced MTBE with methanol, and today all your gasoline has about 10% ethanol in it for that purpose. All the ammonia in this country moved to Canada. Ammonia is made from hydrogen, hydrogen is made from methane, all right? So that all moved out of the country where they didn't have these kinds of controls and whatnot. Hydrogen that was left was very expensive. Hydrogen is made from methane. Most of the hydrogen goes to ammonia, that left. But hydrogen is also used by oil refineries mostly to get sulfur out of crude. And in these days, we were also demanding lower and lower sulfur in our diesel products, for example. And that required more and more hydrogen. The hydrogen had to be made from gas. The gas, you saw the price of gas spike. Hydrogen got expensive, and for the first time ever, diesel got more expensive than regular. And it stays that way to this day, although it's not more expensive to make anymore. It's just that as long as the price got up there, the public doesn't know that it could have gone back down. All right. And some people, because methane was so expensive way to make hydrogen, there were some folks, Eastman included, that decided maybe we should make hydrogen by gasification again. And the idea was to use Texas, well, pet coke, petroleum coke, which is a carbon product that's a byproduct from the oil industry, oil refining industry, and, and uh, lignite in Texas, which is pretty low quality coal, and gasify them both for the purposes of making hydrogen, for the purposes of, because that would be cheaper than making hydrogen from natural gas. So that was big plans to do that. And for chemicals, besides, we already talked about what happens with methane, but it turns out the way we market chemicals in this country, methane and propane prices are just tied to natural gas. 
Okay, natural gas goes up, and the way we write contracts, <laughs> ethane and propane go up the same. So ethane prices went up. Now, there wasn't any supply and demand imbalance in ethane like there was in methane because of people using it to make electricity. Nonetheless, the price of ethane went up by like a factor of two and a half. And so that made all the chemicals made from ethane, that is ethylene and its derivatives, skyrocketed. And the U.S. chemical industry became non-competitive worldwide and nearly shut down. So ethylene prices spiked and propylene prices got to be higher than ethylene, which is, didn't used to be. So what else happened? So a lot of folks in the chemical industry stopped making the commodity chemicals that you make from ethylene and propylene, like polyethylene and polypropylene. A lot of people just said, I'm not going to do that anymore. And people started thinking about ways of using coal, carbon monoxide, C1 chemistries to make things that used to be made out of ethylene and propylene, which were C2 and C3 chemicals, all right? Now, you already saw that happen before when by accident of catalysis that acetic acid went from C2 to C1, but people now started paying attention. Maybe I can do a bunch of things like ethylene glycol and propylene, and I'll make all these things out of coal, because out of C1s, but the C1s were coming from coal, all right? And a lot of folks just went offshore. A lot of the chemical industry said we're going to go to the Persian Gulf where the supplies are plentiful, not particularly expensive. The negative is the infrastructure is not there. So you're making stuff in the wrong part of the world and you've got to transport it all. But people did it and we've started building chemical plants in many of the Persian Gulf countries. And in some places, like Brazil, this seems back asswards, but Brazil actually took cane and they made ethanol out of it and they turned the ethanol into ethylene. By the way, industrially, it used to be the other way around. People made industrial ethanol out of ethylene. But they ran that backwards and basically built ethylene plants, ultimately bio-based, based on, on sugar cane. And in China in particular, feedstocks, coal, both coal gasification, coal liquefaction, became technologies that were being used as feedstocks for their chemical industry. And there was a greater interest in both chemicals and fuels from biomass. Now we're going to have to make stuff out of biomass because the natural gas has gotten expensive and the ethane that's priced like natural gas has gotten expensive. And so we had all kinds of research going around. And we're going to make stuff out of biomass, whether it's the biomass that otherwise could have been food or the biomass components that aren't food. So the cellulosic parts and this stuff. And so a lot of centers and a lot of research was put into let's make our whole industry bio-based, renewable-based. That's actually a little bit of a problem in the oil industry. Crude oil has no oxygen in it. It's mostly carbon and hydrogen. It's got a little bit of sulfur. It's got a little bit of nitrogen. And we add hydrogen to that to get rid of the sulfur, to get rid of the nitrogen. But there isn't any oxygen much in crude oil. But if we start making oils out of biomass, we call that bio-oil, there's quite a bit of oxygen left in those molecules. And when you send them to an oil refinery and the hydrogen hits them, they start making water. That's not a problem except that, as it turns out, by accident of history, most of the catalysts used in the oil refining industry are not water tolerant. And as a result, a lot of catalysis work was done then, even to do the kind of catalysis for the normal refinery operations, the normal refining chemistry, but to try to find new catalysts that could tolerate it if the raw material had more oxygen in it. Okay. And there were calls for more LNG in import infrastructure. Greenspan, chairman of the Fed, he made a big deal out of that. Gas is inexpensive in other parts of the world. It's cheap in the U.S. It's, it's, I said that wrong. And it's expensive in the U.S., so the idea was to import LNG. Not in my backyard, but anyway. And the other thing that happened when gas prices are high was the application of things like directional drilling, the hydraulic fracturing, and microseismic monitoring to start exploiting some other resources, which we all know is shale. I'll get to that more right now. So what happened to natural gas industrial consumption? In that same period of time that it was going up for power production, it was going down by not almost the same amount in terms of chemical production. The U.S. organic chemical industry was nearly destroyed. Okay? What happened to the price? 
Well, the natural gas price went right back down again. Because supply and demand were reestablished, just with different players. The chemical industry was out of the consumption of natural gas while the power industry was in. And the price came back down to about what it was before in the neighborhood of two bucks a million BTUs. Okay? So this is what happens. We have the industry is nearly gone. It's been moved offshore and all the things I just mentioned, but natural gas prices come back down. By the way, so did ethylene prices. When they came back down, at least that part of the chemical industry got back in business again. Are you with me? But the part based on methane, that, that material was going off to feed electrical plants. All right, now I want to go talk about something else, and that's the price of oil. And the price of oil, which I could have had data way back before the, the shocks, but I didn't. But after the oil shocks, oil was between 10 and 15 bucks a barrel. And it kind of stayed that way fairly constant for uh, two and a half decades in the neighborhood of uh, under 20 bucks a barrel until about 2003. In 2003, the price of crude in the United States and the rest of the world, oil is fungible, has the same price for the same quality everywhere in the world because there's good cross-ocean transportation infrastructure. Starting in about 2003, the price of oil started to rise. And it rose because international demand began to exceed international capacity production. That international demand is mostly China and India. But as it did, the price suddenly rose. Nothing wrong with that. That's the way this works. But anytime you have a commodity whose price is going up, that attracts another group of folks called speculators. Speculators don't really want the oil, but as long as it's going to be worth more tomorrow than it was today, they're going to make money on it. And so speculators got in the game, and it looks like there's more demand, but it isn't real. And the price of the oil went up and up and up and up and up until the day that somebody wouldn't pay a higher price tomorrow than they, or today than they did yesterday. And that happened in 2007. And in 2007, triggered by a number of things, it's exactly the same time that the housing bubble happened, but on the day that no one would pay more for a barrel of oil, what happens? The speculators bail out. And the price of oil went from $144 a barrel to $35 a barrel in six weeks. All right? All right, 35 was too low. I mean, it undershot. And after they got that corrected, it went on, and it continued the same rise that it had before this crazy bubble. All right, fine. Now, this is the price of natural gas at the same period of time. Price of natural gas turns out to follow the price of oil, sort of. But it's more spiky. It's spiky because gas is hard to inventory. All right, so little things can disrupt it. So here's the period of time where it was slowly decontrolled from 25 cents a million BTUs up to a little over $2.50 or so cents a million BTUs. And from there it was constant for just about a good long time until this business about the power companies wanting to get in, burn the natural gas, and that made a spike go up. But after the chemical business was driven out of natural gas consumption, the price went back down, and then it rose again, kind of like oil rose again because of total world demand for these products, with some spikes. So this little spike here happened in 2003. There was a cold snap late in the spring. And when you run out of inventory, there isn't any inventory, and so the price spiked at that time. This one here is Katrina. And Katrina not only uh, was a bad storm, but it really did disrupt certain offshore production and onshore distribution in a big way. So that caused a price spike. And this is part of the same peak that uh, oil experienced. And after the crash in the economy in the beginning of the Great Recession, gas prices came down just like oil prices did, OK? So this is the price of gas if I did it right. This is the price of oil if I did it right. And then this time I got them hopefully lined up to exactly the same years. And they kind of follow each other with gas being more spiky because of no inventory until 2010. In 2010, after the adjustment after the crash, oil continued on its way up and gas went down. 
And why is that? The answer is shale. All right? You know what shale is, but for people who didn't, shale is unconventional natural gas in formations that are relatively narrow and of very low permeability. We've always known they're there. We've known they were there as well as hydrocarbons that were in more conventional sandstone formations. Economic, was, uh, economic uh, production was enabled by three technological innovations, none of which were developed for, well, they were developed for other purposes, but then modified for shale, and they included directional drilling, where you didn't have to drill just straight, and microseismic monitoring, which meant you learned how to drill and stay in the middle of a formation by listening carefully to what you're doing, and this thing called slick water hydraulic fracturing. Hydraulic fracturing had been along, around a long time. That's used high pressure fluid of any kind to crack rocks. It turns out it didn't work very well for shale until they did one key thing, and that was, of course, invented here in Texas by George Mitchell's folks. They learned to put drag reducing polymers in it. And that allowed more energy to be where the actual fracture was, given the amount of energy that was put in at the surface. Okay, by putting drag reduction polymers, colloquially it's called slick water, uh, those, those things made shale possible. So you know what it is. Conventional oil or gas might be with, in coal beds. Most of it is in sandstone. Maybe it's associated with oil, or maybe it's not associated with oil. So we have associated, non-associated gas. But there are these shale formations, and if you're willing to drill and figure out how to stay in the middle of the shale formation, and if you're willing to figure out how to crack it in various places, you improve, in a macro scale, the permeability of that rock and gas flows. And it turns out it's not as expensive as I thought. Price of gas was pretty high when this was developed, High prices encouraged kind of lots of technological development. But it turned out it's not so hard to do. So in the United States, our hydrocarbon basins, the places where hydrocarbons are, are mostly situated between the Appalachian Mountains and the Rocky Mountains, or not the Front Range, but where the Wasatch is. And in places where it's in basins, fossil stuff collects. That's true of where our coal fields are. It's true of where our oil fields are. It's true of where our gas fields are. And so it turns out shale is there too. The first shale, of course, was developed around Fort Worth in the Barnett field. And it turned out not to be so hard to get out. The next field was over here at, um, where, where did I go? Here's Haynesville, there in, in East Texas, and associated with the East, East Texas field and also parts of Louisiana. But the one that has everybody's eyes Bulging is this thing in the, around the Appalachians, which runs from New York State down to almost uh, Tennessee in three separate, three separate layers. Marcellus, just because it's big. So, okay, that's where it is, and a lot of other places, and of course now we have some others. And what were the impacts? Well, the government counts shale gas as conventional gas. They didn't used to do that. That doubled our gas reserves. The um, relative price of gas compared to oil changed. I'm going to show you a graph about what I mean in a minute, but I'll get to that. Electric power, gas got so cheap that if people were worried about global warming or carbon dioxide emissions, especially in the power industry, and you were thinking about maybe I'll put in a CO2 capture system, capture and sequestration, just burn natural gas. There's so much shale gas that that makes half as much CO2. That will be the way people do it. All of those closed U.S. methanol plants and ammonia plants, they started back up again because they had cheap methane. And even the one that was in Chile, they just dismantled it and brought it to the U.S. And condensate crackers were restarted. So people were stopped to crack things like you know, ethane and propane, especially that that was coming from natural gas, because remember, there wasn't much of it. And now they started restarting them. And so we make ethylene in this country both ways. We make it from condensate, which tends to relatively have more, it has a higher ratio of ethane to propane than naphtha does, which is low stuff in oil refinery, which has still more ethane than propane, but a lower ratio of ethane to propane. Naphtha is considered more expensive. This country always cracked both. But it was so much shale gas that people chose not to crack naphtha. 
Even an oil refinery would go buy shell gas and not crack so much naphtha. All right. And all of a sudden, the U.S. feedstock advantage for many organic chemicals was restored. So it went from an industry that was almost dead to one that actually was advantaged again on the, on the world stage. Oops. So this is what I wanted to tell you about the prices of these things. There is a chart that people make all the time about the price of oil in dollars a barrel versus the price of gas in dollars a million BTUs. Those are not the same amount of energy. That's not the point. But those two numbers are in the newspaper every day. Price of oil is in the newspaper every day and dollars a barrel. The price of gas is in the newspaper every day is dollars a million BTUs or 1,000 cubic feet. And that ratio has been a factor of 10 since the 1940s. The price of oil in those units are 10 times numerically bigger than the price of gas in dollars per million BTUs. All right, and that wanders around a little bit, but it's been about 10 forever until 2010. And in 2010, that price changed so that in 2012, it was 50. That is, natural gas compared to the fraction it used to be compared to the price of oil was one-fifth the price it used to be. Why? Because of shale because of actually the overproduction of shale. People not only could do it, they made lots of it. And the price kept falling. And there was a time when the price, now today it's not that way anymore. People have returned to a little bit of sanity. Oops. And the price has dropped. So this is when it was over 50, and it's now closer to 20. Yesterday oil was just under $60 a barrel, and gas was just about $3 a million BTUs. That's factor 20. Okay? It used to be gas was always one-tenth the price of oil. Gas is fundamentally, and it looks like it's going to stay that way, about half the price it used to be. No matter what's going on in the world, no matter what's going on with economies or inflation or anything else, gas is suddenly half of what it used to be, or maybe even a little less than that. And that's a big deal, and it's all because of shale. All righty. What does it mean for the chemical industry? There was a time, I wish I'd get the year exactly right. I think it was 11 years ago, but it might have been 10, when not one single chemical plant was under construction in the United States. Zero. No new ones, no expansions of, of any reasonable size. And we were beginning to worry as educators, do we still need to keep cranking out chemical engineers? Because no one's ever going to design and build a plant. Well, not here. Maybe they, of course, work someplace else, okay? Last year, 200 chemical plants were under construction. It turned around completely, all right? Uh, there are nine new ethylene crackers that will be on stream by the first quarter of the year 2020. They're under construction. They're not going to be canceled. They have a combined capacity of about 28 billion 26 billion pounds a year of ethylene. The capacity in this country for ethylene before that was 60 billion. This is nearly adding 50% capacity that will for sure be on stream in another I can, two years from now. And another, I doesn't say it here, but there's like a bunch more that are under construction, or under consideration. They may or may not get built. Where's that going to go? Who wants it? Do you think this country needs a 50% or a 60% or an 80% or whatever the number turns out to be? Increase in raw material for its basic chemicals actually doesn't need them. So the stuff's almost all going for export. And you can't export ethylene, so they're going to turn it into something else. And the something else is mostly polyethylene, polypropylene, a little bit of other things like ethylene glycol, vinyl chloride stuff, but mostly polyethylene. But even it's mostly going to go for export, OK? Short term, the world doesn't need that either. But they will in a while. All right, as you know now, but we didn't know this in the year 2000 when hydraulic fracturing of fields that had shale gas in them were first developed, it works for oil as well in certain fields. 
Now, these fields tend to have more chalk and other stuff in them, but as you know, especially the Bakken field of the part of the Wilson Basin in North Dakota and Eagle Ford field here in Texas, well, here's the Bakken field. It's dolomite between two layers of shale. It's 200,000 square miles, 130 feet thick. It's got light oil. It's got some gas in it. Here's the Eagle Ford field. It's also a carbonate containing shale, 50 miles wide, 400 miles long, 250 feet thick. Again, light oil with associated gas. And what did that do to this country? As you probably remember, in the year 2000, we imported a little over 60% of our crude. In 2017, if we chose, we could import zero. Now, we choose not to because we have commitments, and so we're exporting some and importing some. But we could be 100% oil independent this year, all because of shale oil. Fair enough? All right. And there's other fields. Permian Basin has got shale oil, and so do others. All right, so here's some of the shale. These are all the shale plays, including shale oil as well as shale gas. There's the Eagle Ford. Here's what's going on in West Texas. Here's the Bakken. These three are the biggest right now, but there are others in this country that are being developed. All right? And it's not too expensive. We tend to overproduce. When we overproduce, the price of oil gets down there close to the 40s. That seems to be a number which at least some people stop drilling shale wells. Okay? But it's back over 50 now, almost 60, and people are out there, number of rigs are back at up again, so some price in there, and it looks like it's going to be that way for many decades to come. All right, so what is this? This is the price of crude. Uh, this is when it crashed. This is when it went up, went up to $100, and then in 2014 it fell, and it fell lower than 40, or about 40, and today it's back up almost to 60. But that's, this from here to here is the application of fracking technologies to oil, and the application for gas happened almost, almost a decade earlier, okay? The technologies are slightly different. The chemical makeup of the fluid that fracks best is different, okay? And it took a while to figure that out, but it's changed totally the economics in this country. All right, so what is the impact of shale oil on the chemical industry? Well, when there was shale gas, but before there was shale oil, okay, oil was expensive, gas was plentiful, people started thinking about, let's turn gas to liquids. They did here at, in this center and other places. I mean, we know how to do that. I mean, roughly speaking, you take gas, and if you want, you can reform it. You get CO2 and hydrogen. You can fish your shit to make longer molecules, and you can do that. Okay, a lot of interest in doing that. When shale oil came along, people not so interested because oil got cheap again. By the way, you can do this gas to liquids or it actually could have been coal to liquids, but nobody's gonna make anything out of coal anymore. Both shale oil and shale gas are so plentiful and so cheap, you're never gonna use coal. Aromatics. <coughs> I forgot to explain, but aromatics I told you before were made in oil refineries in order to make high-octane high aviation gasoline for piston-powered airplanes. Well, we stopped using piston-powered airplanes in the mid-50s, so we don't need so much aviation fuel, high-octane aviation fuel containing aromatics, but the chemical industry needs the aromatics, so the oil refinery folks have been still making aromatics, not for high-octane fuel, but for the chemical industry, and they've been doing that forever. And for a while there was thought that maybe oil was too expensive and maybe we should think about shale gas to aromatics, but maybe, but most likely now with shale oil cheap again, almost certainly aromatics will continue to be made from, from the oil business, not from, not from C1s, although there was some th thought of it. Now we have what I call lack of production discipline. I have no idea what the equilibrium price of either shale gas or shale oil ought to be. I, I really don't, but we can kind of guess, because when it gets down to 40-ish or $45 a barrel, you can see the rig count drop. And when it gets up to 60, it's way up again, so it's somewhere in between. And the same thing's for gas. Gas is a little tight right now at $3, 
And when it gets down below 250, people stop drilling so many shell gas wells. So it's somewhere in there. OK. All right. So what's that mean? Um, say you want to bring a new unit of shale gas to the market. There's a market for that. And that market is a coal-fired power plant. More than half the electrical energy in this country is generated by coal. And there's pressure to reduce CO2 emissions. Gas makes half as many as coal for the same amount of electricity. So, and you can always burn gas in a coal-fired boiler. You can't burn coal in a gas-fired boiler, but you can burn gas in a coal-fired boiler. So switching from coal to gas is easy. If you have the idea that you want to drill another shale gas well, you can find a customer. And that new incremental customer will be a coal-fired power plant. Okay. If you want to drill a new shale oil well, where's that customer? Unlike gas, which is kind of local, oil is worldwide. So if you start drilling shale oil wells faster than worldwide demand for oil increases, the price will drop, which is how it got down to 40 each dollars a barrel. So you don't want to do that. Oil is worldwide market. You have to wait for the worldwide. But where's worldwide demand doing? It's growing, not in the U.S. The U.S. demand for oil is stable and falling. It's falling in part because we've demanded, we've legislated more efficient cars. Higher mileage, the amount of oil that we require is actually going to go down slightly. Okay, but worldwide, worldwide economy grows, and the price just depends on don't build a new oil well faster than worldwide demand wants, or the price will fall. You've got a choice. You can do either one. All right. So that's what this says. It says that U.S. oil demand is stable or slightly decreasing, and so you have to, you have to think about worldwide supply and demand. All right, so what's likely to happen? Natural gas substitute for coal will be the primary way we do carbon management in this country for a long time to go, long before we do stuff like CO2 scrubbers. Uh, increased deployment of natural gas turbines, especially natural gas combined cycle turbines, means that we will make electricity more efficiently than we ever did before. So coal-fired power plant, especially if it's really high pressure, maybe a little over 40% efficient. Combined cycle natural gas could be 70% efficient. Temperature gets a little high there and we start making a little too much NOx. But the point is we can make electricity more and more efficient from combined cycle. And what that means is we will start using electricity for applications where you otherwise couldn't be able to capture the carbon dioxide. So we're going to use electricity for local transportation capture the carbon dioxide if we're going to capture it all, or even make the electricity more efficiently in central power plants. So that's why electric cars make some sense if, as a CO2 thing. And the same thing for heating people's houses. Natural gas will stop being used to heat people's houses, and people use heat pumps instead. Because heat pumps can be more efficient than just burning the natural gas. OK. So um, increased US production and export of chemicals. That's going to happen. Aromatics will be made from oil. I said that before. And research that was done when natural gas was expensive. Remember those people were thinking about, I'm going to make it from coal. I'm going to learn new C1 chemistries. Well, natural gas is cheap. Maybe C1 chemistries are the way to go to, for some things that used to be made from C2s. All right? Just because we did the research because we thought we were going to make it out of carbon monoxide from coal, carbon monoxide doesn't know where it came from. So all those advantages are still going to be there. There are going to be some interesting things. So for many intermediates, depending on local availability and whether you got lots of C2s or C3s or don't, whether you have C1 chemistry or C2 and C3 chemistry is going to depend upon a local situation and some very interesting engineering and catalysis. So those are cool opportunities. All right, now I'm going to say, I'm already gone along, but that's okay, you're captive. There's some unexpected shale gas impacts, and one of the ones is that because shale gas and is so plentiful and people have stopped using naphtha in their ethane crackers, we're not making as much propane as we used to, propylene as we used to. And for, propylene's always been a byproduct. 
Okay, propylene was a byproduct. You sized the plant for so much ethylene. You got propylene, and you could always get rid of the propylene that was excess because you could make a very low quality product called atactic polypropylene, which is used for roofing tar. And you could always do that. So that's how you balance the market. You could, the propylene you made was a byproduct. But now what was happening is we stopped cracking as much oil refinery like naphtha, and we didn't even have enough propylene to meet our needs. And so for the first time ever in this country, people had to make on-purpose propylene. All right? And you got some choices. And you could do it, something called catalytic dehydrogenation. You just take propane. And in a catalyst, it's a little bit lower temperature than cracking. And there's an alternative, which is a three-step route that goes methane to methanol to propylene. And that one clearly is much more capital and more complicated. This one starts with a more expensive starting material. All right, which way to go? People have announced both ways, but that one's actually been built. That's the first on-purpose uh, propane dehydrogenation plant in the U.S., and as far as I can tell, that's probably the largest distillation column in a U.S. chemical plant. I'm sure I can find an oil refinery with one bigger than that, but that's almost certainly the largest one. That's in Freeport. And that's the largest uh, technology of that type ever built. All righty. Here's another impact that was kind of unexpected. Shale gas has too many heavies. The very first field we developed at Barnett actually was a dry field, and it made had methane in it, not much else. But we quickly found out that most of that field had a lot of ethane and propane in it. And in a Marcellus, it's over 25% condensate. There's oodles of ethane and propane and some butanes in with that gas. And there's zero infrastructure to do anything with that stuff. Pennsylvania doesn't have any infrastructure to eat up ethane. There's no place to put it. So, oops. So shale gas has too many heavies. Shale oil has too many lights. You go take shale oil out of Bakken and you find a way higher percentage of ethane and propane dissolved in it than you find in most conventional oils. And the reason for both of these problems is exactly the same. Shale isn't permeable. Unlike sandstones, where these different molecular weights have had the eons to separate, one into a gas phase and one into a liquid phase, in shale that separation didn't get to happen. So if it happens a little bit at the wellhead, that's one thing. But the oil still is more volatile, and we've had some pretty sad accidents when, when that stuff got loose. Okay? So shale oil has got too many lights, shale gas has got too many heavies, and the problem in both cases is the same. Ethane, propane, butane. All right. So what can you do about that? The propane, butane, you can always make them look at petroleum gas, so you can always get rid of those. The ethane and propane go to the chemical industry. I already told you, 26 billion pounds a year new steam cracking capacity is under construction. And there are, we're going to be choking on that stuff. And yet you still want more shale oil. You still like that price of, at the gas pump to keep falling. People keep producing it. The C2s, the C4s are still coming. And the chemical industry has no place to put them. No place to put them. Basically, our ethane is free now. Sometimes it's even negative price. People will pay you to take it off their hands. All right? Now, what are we going to do about that? Making cheap things out of excess C2s to C4s doesn't usually make a lot of economic sense, except we're drowning in this stuff. So what do you do? And what's been, there was a project here in AM to think about using Fisher Tropes. We'll take those C2s, the C4s, and we'll reform them, and, or gasify them, reform them, turn them into carbon monoxide and hydrogen, use fisher trope technology to grow long molecules, and dump those molecules in the oil refinery. Okay? And you can do that. And that's been done before. It's been done during war and stuff, and it's been done on other places to try to get, to monetize the value of excess hydrocarbon resources. Purdue has just got a, a, a National Science Foundation ERC, Engineering Research Center, called CSTAR, whose job it is to worry about just this problem, to monetize the excess low molecular weight components of either in shale oil by converting them to something higher that can be a refinery feedstock. 
Okay, it seems so dumb to turn good chemical feedstock into fuel, but we're drowning in it. You got to do something or you won't be able to continue to develop the oil well. I heard, and I wish I don't have a copy of it, but I saw someone else in a presentation the day before yesterday show something from some place, I don't know if it was the Wall Street Journal or where, that said that continuing health of the Permian Basin depends upon finding a use for all this excess gas that's out there. You can't develop it, there's no place to put it. So this is the idea. The idea of Sea Star is to take the alkane, dehydrogenate it to olefins, and then polymerize the olefins till they're about C10 or C15, or I mean C10 to C16, give or take. So the technology looks like that. You take the stuff that we've got too much of, we dehydrogenate it, it gets, gets rid of hydrogen. You take this stuff, which are now olefins, you'll ligamerize it. There is a separation, but it's a cheap separation. It's between C2s and C3s and C18s. That's an easy separation to do. Unlike our conventional cracking, which has an ethane ethylene splitter, which is really expensive, and a propane propylene splitter. We don't have any of that. OK, so that's the idea. So anyway, the advantage is that it avoids gasification or steam reforming capital, and it's a little bit lower temperature processes, and the oligomerization catalysts are tolerant to virtually everything that's a byproduct of the first reaction. And it has already been practiced for C5s and C4s, and it's practiced now for C3s. That's that Dow plant I just showed you. And so, and oligomerization is a long practice technology. The disadvantages are the thermodynamics for ethane dehydrogenation are very disadvantageous. At lower temperatures, uh, the Gibbs free energy is very disadvantageous. So you're either going to have really low conversions or you're going to have to do something like reactive separation, where you take out the products at the same time you're doing the reaction. We know that. There's uh, major catalyst development that's going to have to be required. Um, and these people are thinking about doing this in different places. You might do it in a refinery that finds itself with excess of these lights. You might do it at a gas processing plant that's even smaller scale. You might do it at a well pad. What happens in a Bakken now? If you, Bakken produces oil, if there's gas that comes up with that oil, there's no pipeline to the well pad. So that gas is flared and it has bad optics. And part of what these folks are thinking about is, can you convert that gas to a liquid, which is trucked out of that well pad by truck every couple of days. Can you convert that gas to a liquid in a little device that sits there right at the well pad unmanned and it just magically turns these lights into heavies? And that's what they're working on. Okay? All righty. That's going to take a whole lot, especially at the smaller scale, a lot of process integration and process intensification because we all understand that small scale plants are very expensive per unit of production. So that won't be economically successful at all unless we do some really clever things. And uh, there are likely to be a lot of these things. We've never mass produced chemical plants before, but there could be quite a few hundred of these things absolutely identical made. So we'll see how that works out. Okay, outlook. U.S. oil and condensate output is the highest level it's been in 45 years. We're now self-sufficient. Uh, shale will assure that conventional feedstocks remain economically advantaged for many decades to come. And that also means the chemical industry now has stable feedstocks. Places that have wet shale gas but no ethane processing capacity are likely to build something, to use it. And this is particularly true in western Pennsylvania. And so when we talk about this at Carnegie, it's a big deal because they got to do something locally with stuff in a part of the country that doesn't have that. That's not true here in Texas. You got a lot of chemical processing and ethane consuming infrastructure here. But there's parts of this country that don't. And the chemistries, C1s and C2 chemistries, will compete with each other. Some will be clever. It will be maybe clever catalyst or maybe clever engineering or maybe pro clever process intensification that makes one work better than the other, but it's going to make people, give people some interesting projects to work on for a great long time to come. And guess what? That is over.